and welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Camilla Cleghorn. I'm Chris Yee. And today we're going to be taking a look at Bot Factory. Uh, this is ga a game that was on my most anticipated list. I know I've been looking forward to it for a while. It's delivered. We've played it. We have thoughts. Before we share them though, let's check out how it plays. All right, so we're going to be taking a look at Bot Factory by Zhao Quintela Martins and Vital Acerda, published by Eagle Griffin Games. Here we have it set up for a three-player game. Whoever is the last player on this first turn gets an additional speech bubble to start. The play of this game is going to be over the course of several rounds until the end game is triggered, one of two ways. Either all the bots of one color have been built, or one single player completes their fifth bot. At that point, the players would complete that round, then proceed into end game scoring. Each round has three phases, the move workers, perform actions, and then maintenance. During the move workers phase, everyone's going to take their meeple. In this first round here, the meeples are off the board, so you do spend the first round placing the meeples. In subsequent rounds, they'll be out on the board, and you will go from left to right in resolution of this phase. But for the first time, it's all open, so we'll go with the first player, and they place their meeples standing up on one of the available slots out here on the board, like so. If you are only playing a two-player game, it is important to note that you cannot go onto the tile or area of the workspace here that has Sandra or the pink meeple on it. After that, we are going to perform actions, and these are resolved, again, from left to right through the different boards as well as the action spaces on the bottom. Once you complete your actions, you will lay your player pawn down here, like this. After that, Sandra will go. Once everyone is done, then you'll proceed into the next round, or the next phase of this, which is the maintenance phase. But let's come back to that after we talk about the individual actions that can be taken on each board here. All right, the first board here is called our assembly board, and it is all about putting out the parts to build the robots. So if you put a worker in the first spot, as you can see here, you can put out one part, one or two in the second, and one to three if you go to this third spot. However, it is going to cost you a communication token to even go to that spot. So you would pay that to the supply when you placed your worker there. When it is your turn, you will take the piece that you want to place, place it out on the board. Note, if you ever cover up one of these um, executive actions, you get to immediately take that action. Um, all of them are the same. They are, you pay a command token in order to take a tile over here from the parts production board, one of the topmost of the, of, of the four colors. When you're on the assembly board here, you'll see you have another executive action in which you can pay a command token to take one of these two tiles that are here on the crate. When you place these tiles out on the robots, if you are putting out the very first body part onto this robot, you will take two uh, speech tokens of your color. If you're the second, put out the second body part, you as well as take it out. If you put the third, if you complete the robot, then you actually get the robot. Now, it is to note that you do have to have a red contract in order to put this robot on in order to claim it. And we'll talk more about that once we get to the third board, our project board. So we'll come back to that in a minute. When it is Sandra's turn on this board, she will discard these two tiles and then refill them, starting with the current active tile up here, like so. Ah, uh, not quite like so, like so. The second board over here is called our part production board, and this is going to be where you can get the different parts for your robots. The three spots, the first one actually allows you to gain a speech token, so if you go here, but you're only getting to take one to three actions on this board. The second one is one to four actions or one to six actions. Your actions are going to be tracked over here. So for example, if uh, this color went here, they would get one to four actions, so they would mark they get four actions. Your actions are going to be to either take one of the two available uh, parts that are right here. So let's say we wanted to take the yellow bottom or to turn the wheel here. The wheel is going to go in this these four quarters, so you would turn it two. And then that was two actions, so they have two more. Maybe they also want to take the red bottom for three. And the last one, they will turn again. Now note, now up in this yellow spot here, we do have an empty one, so we would fill it with our current active tile. The executive actions here are as you can trade out three tiles that you currently have in your supply for one of these available from the top of the stack. The other executive action that you have on this board is annotated right here. If you happen to take a tile that is has this little tab on it, then you can pay a command token in order to place one of your robot parts 
on the robot board. This does also combo over here with you would be able to pay another command token if you place this one here, for example, in order to take a part up here of your choice. Now, when Sandra is on this board, she is going to refill in a clockwise manner any empty slots. Now on our third board here, the project board is where we get these contracts. When you come to the first spot here, you will able, be able to pick one of these contracts and claim it, hoping to therefore fulfill it with the robot that is requested up here. If you take the contract that is in this spot right here, the right lower one, you will gain a speech token. If you take the contract on the left bottom most, you can pay a command token in order to place a part on a robot on the first board. When you claim one of these contracts, you just pull it down into your player area. Later in the game, if you complete a robot of that color, or you have to have these in order to complete a robot of that color, and then you would just attribute that robot on it to show that it is complete. If you go to the second action, it plays out the same. You just get to take two contracts from up here. Note that these contracts do not refill at this stage of the round. The executive action for this board is right here, and it says that you can always trade out two contracts that you have not filled in your player area to take one of these wild parts down here. There are two of each body part, and they count for all four colors. When Sandra is on this board and activates, she will remove the bottom row and refill as so. And our final board over here is going to be our finance board. The three spots on the bottom down here are gonna tell you how many speech tokens you're allowing yourself to invest in this uh, portion of the board here, which is going to go to end game scoring. So this first one is one to two, then one to three, or one to four. And these are up two values. You don't have to spend four, for example, if you go there. And it is to note that these speech tokens come from your player supply, not the general supply. So you do have to have them available to you in order to spend them. And this is where you're going to score, like I said, end game scoring opportunities. If you want to place a speech token on one of this bottom row, it is gonna cost you one speech token. So this bottom, these three goals here, if you put one of yours on it, now you have unlocked that end game scoring opportunity for yourself. If you're the first one to place one there, you get the yellow number on the left. If you are in future rounds, the second player, you would get the opportunity on the right. For example, if you were able to fill this contract here, which means you complete a yellow robot and a green robot, you would get five points for this, as well as for having an objective complete in this row here. So this would be complete seven points. Another example here, this is just a yellow robot. This would be worth two, four points. It is important to note on these end game scoring opportunities here that these, even though they both have a yellow robot, they cannot be the same robot. These have to be unique robots that you have built and use for this scoring opportunity. Moving up the rows here, you see you have to have two speech tokens available to put one on this row. You would simply put one in the back in the supply and the other on the contract. These are more expensive in speech tokens to put out, but they're also worth more end game. You can see two, five, seven, for the row. The last thing you can use your speech tokens are on this finance board is to influence or up the price of any one of these colored robots per speech token. So if I spent one, I could move the blue up here. If you ever cause one of these beads to cross this line, you immediately get that benefit as well. Here, you can take a contract from those available. And here you can place a robot over on that first board again, or a robot part out on that first board. There are no executive actions for the player on this board. So let's talk about what Sandra does. When Sandra is on this board, she is going to move up the lowest bead one spot. So in this example here, she would move red up one. Now let's say she's here again next time the board looks like this, she would actually move all three of these up. However, if all four are tied, she has no influence on this board. All right, the maintenance phase is pretty short and sweet here. Any bot that was completed during the action round, these will remove and go to the discard pile up here above the robot color, as well as the uh, marker over here on the finance board will go down one spot for the robot color that was completed. We also will refresh our projects on this by discarding the lowest two, move everything down and refilling. Okay. 
At this point, players will either proceed into a new round, again, moving their workers from left to right. So this one would go first and he would decide perhaps to come here and stand up. This one would maybe, they do have to move to a new board, so it would perhaps come here. And maybe the blue player wants to come up here as well, vying for that first spot. Sandra is always going to move to the right, circling back around to the front first board, as well as go to the first available spot, um, again, from left to right. So in this case, she would move here, I'll circle around to the first board and go to this spot here. But again, had in that last round, we either completed one person had completed five robots or a single color had been completed, we would have gone into final scoring. For final scoring, we are going to take our first board here, our assembly board, clear it off and turn it over to have a score chart. Our three players can just place out a speech token of their color to keep track. First, for any bots that you have completed, you will look here at the finance board to see how much that color is worth. For example, here, every, every robot is currently worth eight, but if this was up here, the green would be worth 10 and so on and so forth. So you will go through and calculate how many points you get for each of your bots completed. Next, you're gonna take a look down here and see any of these contracts that you have fulfilled with bots that you have built as well, and you would calculate those. So for example, here, the orange player would get the two, four points for having a red bot built. And finally, for each pair of speech tokens you have left in your personal supply, you will get one point. So two to one conversion on leftover uh, speech tokens. But we do have a couple negative uh, points here that we have to calculate as well. For any of these contracts over here that you had a speech bubble on that you were not able to complete. So for example, if you did not get a red robot here, you would lose the number of points shown on the actual contract. Note it is only the points on the contract, not the ones to the side of the board. So example here, if orange did not get a red robot, they would lose two points. For each extra part tile you have in your personal supply that you have not used to building a robot, you will lose one victory point. And finally, for each incomplete project tile, so if you have taken a project and you were not able to get it fulfilled with a robot, you'll lose two points for that as well. After everyone has calculated up those different scores, the highest points wins. All right, so we've gotten this to the table a couple different times now. And I just think going into it, I was really excited about it. Like I said, most anticipated, but also very hesitant, I guess nervous almost. Um, Vital Lacerda is known for these heavier games, right? Lots of mechanisms, lots of things going on, lots of strategy, that long-term strategy. I tend to be a little more uh, tactical in my, in my play style. Okay. Um, so I was really nervous, but also really excited because I have liked a lot of his designs. Uh, they just definitely are an investment. You know, and sometimes, and I find like sometimes too, when I'm in the games, you end up playing with people who take the games a lot more serious than I do. And I, you know, I'm more like beep, beep, boop, boop, <laughs> you know. And they're Very like, robotic. Yeah, so right. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Push these buttons. That's how I make, yeah. that's how I make robots. Beep, beep, boop, boop. Ah. So. As do we all. As, as, as you should. Um, but I, I have to say, I found it a very pleasant and good experience. This was really kind of a sweet spot for me. And I, not to spoil my end review here, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. What did you think going into this? I, I had some apprehension as well because okay. Lacerda is a designer that I tend to enjoy. I don't know uh, Joao Martins too well. I, mm -hmm. I've been seeing his name pop up a little bit more. Uh, but I haven't actually gotten to play any of the, the other stuff that he's done. But... I was nervous because the previous entry in what they call their thinky filler line, Mercado de Lisboa, I gave a four. Mm -hmm. I really disliked it because it was it was a part of Lisboa, the bigger game, and it just it didn't have enough homage to the original game to really make it feel like that. And this one does more. This one is a little bit of a riff on the worker placement aspect of Kanban EV or Kanban. And uh, But in just a, a lighter, f more fun setting, mm -hmm. and I think that the weight of what they did, how heavy, how thinky the game is, is very appropriate for how cutesy the box cover is. Yes. It's got these little robots, the, the boop, boop, beep, beep yes. mentality, if you will. Yes. Yeah, I'm so, a fan of beep, beep, boop, boop, beep. What'd you say? Beep, beep, boop, beep? Yeah, yeah. One, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Got zero. it. Yes, yes. Mentality. Right. Yeah. Um, for sure. And how did you find, because I've not played Kanban, how did you find that this compared to Kanban, not in your enjoyment of them, but the mechanism specifically. That whole worker placement line right across mm -hmm. the bottom, that's ripped right out of Kanban. Uh, and in fact, the, there's the, the four different stations in here, which is very similar to Kanban, where you have, I think it's five different areas 
one of them is you can act, you know, activate any of the other four areas. Mm -hmm. So this is a little simplified. It's only four areas, uh, but it does the same thing. The the wake up order you you have to move to a different area of the factory, right. uh, and then that's the order that you fire off actions, and that's the order that you then move and set up for the next round. That's the exact same. Okay. Which I find really impressive to take that what I think is a very fun core of that of the very large thinky heavy Kanban game, mm -hmm. and they're putting into something that's medium weight, you know what I mean? It really is, and that's, that's the point I wanted to make, is like, at no point in this game did I feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. with the amount of options. Um, I did, I, 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 so sometimes with worker placement, it can be, can lead to frustration if that worker placement spots, the spots are too tight. You know, it's like, I need this next. Oh, well now I gotta waste this whole turn because I can't go where I need to because somebody else is there. And I, I like the way that this game uh, always gives you options, whether that's from fine, I can go to a different space and maybe not optimize it, but I'm still going to get what I need. Or one thing that Vitala Serta is really known for is those executive actions. Mm -hmm. All right, well, maybe I can't get it here, but if I go over there and get it, I can get it through an executive action so I can still keep my, it's not an engine, but my plan in place. So I can still keep going on my journey, whatever it is that you're trying to do, your plan, you know, you can keep it moving. And I really, really like that. That's one of my favorite things that he does is those executive actions. And I think it's very, very well done here where it ties that to the worker placement spots as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, I only need to play one robot part so I could go there in that last space that's available, or I could go here and get two actions out of it. You know, so you really have a chance to optimize every turn. And I don't think I ever felt like I can't get done what I need to get done. I just have to look at it from a different angle. Yeah, exactly. And, and these spaces, even though I'm on this board, I'm activating this little part here, some of those bonus actions, the executive actions, affect other boards. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I got blocked out of the, you know, assembling right. spot, spot, like probably the most important spot. But I can I can do an assembly from over here, yeah. which does get me the the robot on the blueprint. You know, yes. what I mean, there's fun ways to pivot, and so I find it compared to Kanban a little bit more loose. Mm -hmm. You know, in, instead of rigidly tight. That was yeah. one of the, my main issues with Kanban is that if you fall out of the sequence, mm -hmm. if you get blocked out on spaces, sometimes you're like, my plan. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and this one has a little bit of that tension, has enough for the weight of game that it is. And so mm -hmm. that that really impresses me. I think that, hey, this is great that I do feel some tension. I would rather go to that spot, but since I can't, mm -hmm. how do I react right. best to this? Right, as well as maintaining that without being overwhelming. I yes. think that this really kind of hits that spot it was going for with having the inner interwoven mechanisms and gameplay, f uh, which which kind of satisfies those those gamers that like those complex games, mm -hmm. but also keeping it light enough where it's not going to be overwhelming for those that like like a game that is mechanical and mechanically sound, but not overwhelming to where you have to make the right move or else you're out. You know, at no right. point at the end of the game, I really do feel like I don't know which way this is going to go. You know, I have a feeling you're going to win, but I have no idea by how much. Or I'm going to win, and I think I have it because of this, but let's see. And so I really think it does come down. There's there's some good tension um, in the game as well. So let me ask you one thing. Mm -hmm. One of my least favorite mechanisms usually in games is uh, something takes three steps to build. And so whoever, <laughs> whoever builds the last step of it gets the bonus. Yeah. Right? And this game has that. It does. Does that bother you in this game? So I had a lot of concerns about that going in. And I'm reading the rule book, and I'm like, but I don't get it, you know? I mean, then why wouldn't you just hold off and always be the last one to put it on there? That doesn't make sense. Um, and I will say I, I really did not mind it in a lower player count game. Okay. I found that you're able to uh, plan your turns enough, and if you really have to have that robot, then maybe you hold off and you have the, the resources you need. I think you have to have a speech bubble or something like that to go to that one to three parts. Space, yeah. something like that, you know. So maybe I'll go a little bit later, but I have everything and I can build the entire robot and I ensure that I get it. So right. in those lower player count games, I think it gives you that flexibility and there are some of that, that tension and frustration. Um, but you also can kind of see it coming. I know what the other person has or mm -hmm. people if it's two. I do think it would be 
not to my liking, I guess, or too tight for me in a higher player count game. If you're pushing it to four, I can see myself getting really frustrated with it. That's been my experience. It, okay. Not super frustrated, but it's it's a bit more Annoyed. chaotic. Yeah, yeah like, right. Oh, oh, they finished up the green row. Okay, well, uh, you know what I mean? You have to pivot a lot more in a four-player yeah. game. I thought the game scales down really Very well to two, well. with Sandra just blocking off one board at a time. Yeah. I think that's a great way to do it, and there's enough tension, I think, still, of trying to build the robots. But you also get a lot of payoff yes. for building any single robot piece, the first that's and the second huge. one. That's huge, Getting yes. those two extra speech bubbles, you're like, oh, right. I'm going to just do a really beefed up action somewhere else next. Yeah, yeah you finish the robot, fine, I'll, I'll build another one before the game's done but I'm getting some good payoff for doing the steps before right. it. And I think because of that, because you can see it coming, because you can plan for it, and because you get something else out of it, if it doesn't go in your favor, at least you got to grab another part, or at least you get a couple mm -hmm. speech bubbles if you pivot, something like that. It didn't bother me in those lower player count games. In fact, I think it did kind of add a little bit to the tension of the game. You yeah. know, and kind of making sure you're planning it out and having that plan. And I really like the two-player variant with Sandra moving because it's methodical. It's not a roll a die and see where she goes. You know that you're going to get to move before her, so she's going to go to that board. So I need to go to that board now because she's going to block it off for Chris, who goes later, or, or, or what it may be. I really like that. So yeah, I think two to three is the sweet spot for me on this game. And um, I don't care to to go back to a four-player game of this. Um, but two to three, I really, it doesn't get in the way. I think it adds to the tension mm -hmm. without increasing AP or analysis paralysis. Yeah. You know, you, you have to be aware of it. Um, any, any other thoughts on the game before we kind of get to our final thoughts here? I know this is so silly. But I really like that this little oh, wheel so here, good. just like it, it just pops on the cardboard here because it's just going to rotate a little bit. It works. I don't know, like that not having to plastic crimp yes. cinch the thing on. I don't know why, but, but I also, think that's a good look. But also, I mean, and I'm, I'm a big fan of like the um, uh, magnetic ones as well. I think they work really well. The, I think this is genius because it probably is less of a production cost for them. Just mm -hmm. a double layer on one part of the board and then, you know, I mean, it's such a simple mechanism. Um, no, it works and it's really smooth. Production's great. It looks really yes. good. It has it's a very adorable. fun, inviting theme. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think I think might as well just go into okay final scores and stuff. You want to take it away? Sure. All right. So I'm giving this one an eight because okay. I I enjoy plenty of Lacerda's bigger complex games, but sometimes I just want to teach one mm. without going. Oh, how do the rules for this go? Right. It, I I played this one a few weeks apart at one point and. But having not really like looked into or thought about it too much, I was able to then teach it again a few weeks later and be like, "Yeah, that's all of it. Yeah. It's nice. It's uh, but as we also said, it's not a game that lacks teeth. It does right. have them there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that I don't know if anything. The biggest negative I would have would be just waiting for the right pieces to come out on the wheel. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You just have to adapt to it. Maybe yellow middle piece isn't coming out for a little bit, but." you need to kind of, you know, do stuff to then make it happen so it can come out or plan around that and try and focus on other robots and do one of the actions where you can sacrifice the yellow blueprint uh, because you don't want that at the end of the game at <laughs> negative two points. So that's what I mean, but the game still has some of those signature teeth in it but it's still very approachable. So an eight for me. An eight for you? All right, well, I'm coming in at a nine for this one. Whoa, I okay. really enjoyed it. And like I said, I had a lot of, I was excited but so nervous going into it um, that it would be the Mercado de, La, de Lisboa experience, or something like that, and it just wouldn't work or still be too, too much. And um, I didn't have that at all. I really enjoyed it. The more I played it, the more I liked it. Uh, so it definitely, I think, has that depth there to where it does reward with multiple plays. But that being said, after the first play, you also don't have that feeling of like, ah. I need to play this more. I'm missing something. I mm. think the rule book is fantastic. And we've been harping on that quite a bit here in the office lately. You can read the rule book and understand how to play um, just straight from the rule book. And I think that is, is so important, especially for a game like this that is going to be about planning your turns and making sure that you are strategizing a couple turns ahead to, so you know where you want to go, what's the most efficient way to get there. I think it really sings again, like I said, at two to three players. So not quite a fan of it at that four, but I love the flexibility. I think the look, they nailed it, keeping it light, but having some of those deeper mechanisms that's going to keep you coming back over and over. So, so yeah, I very much enjoyed this game. I, I want to get it to the table a couple more times, even in the future. And in our job, that sometimes it's, it's, we move to games 
quickly. Yeah, we reviewed it. Okay, I won't touch it again for a year or till the next, you know, um, conference or something like that. But this is one that I want to get to the table again and that's again awesome. and play. And so, you can because yes. it's not so rules overwhelming. Right. I think that's a it, yeah, it, it nails what it's going for really. Absolutely, well. absolutely. They knew what they wanted to do and they put the time in and they got it right. I think so. Yeah. So Bot Factory for me really saying is I'm uh, coming in at a nine for that. So that's it for us. Yeah. Thanks for joining us here on the Dice Tower, taking a look at Bot Factory. I'm Camilla Cleghorn. I'm Chris Yee. Beep, beep, boop, boop. Zero, 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 one. Beep.